we're live. Uh, let's just wait for a couple of attendees to join in and then we can start. Yep, attendees are joining in. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, in today's webinar, the topic for today's webinar is how compost helps feed the globe and tackle climate change. We have Kat Heinrich, who's a food waste specialist. She's a moderator for today's webinar. Uh, Kat has been a moderator for many other of Be Waste Wise's webinars, which you'll find on the video panel section of our website. Kat, along with Heis Langeweld, uh, runs this website called Beyond Food Waste. They discuss a lot about various issues surrounding food waste on the website. So please, you could head to beyondfoodwaste.com to know more. And today, Kat is going to talk to Jane Gilbert, who's the chair at ISWA's Biological Treatment Working Group. And uh, we have received your questions well in advance. If you have any other questions, please share them in the Q&A section. Kat will pick them up as and when it's relevant to the conversation. And that's it from my end. Over to you, Kat. Thank you, Sweta, um, for the introduction. So yes, as, as Sweta mentioned, uh, my name is Kat Heinrich. I'm a director at Rawtech, um, based in South Australia, and very passionate about tackling food waste. Um, so yeah, really excited to be able to be joined today by Dr. Jane Gilbert, who I'll be introducing shortly. Uh, but the topic today, as Sweetha mentioned, is really about what's the connection between compost and um, climate change, as well as looking at food security. And I think this is a really relevant topic, especially for this week um, with COP26 about to happen, the big climate summit. So when you think about it, if we're going to to reach net, a net zero future, we really need to consider the way that we're sustainably or not sustainably managing resources. And a component of that is looking at how we manage organic waste and how we treat it into products such as compost. Um, so today's fo focus of the discussion is, is looking at that topic um, and really delving in detail about it. So I'd now like to introduce um, Jane. So Jane is actually trained as a micro biologist um, and she's an expert on all things compost. She's actually the author of a book called The Composting Troubleshooter. I have a copy, oh my gosh, you can't see it here because of the background, but I have a copy here um, and it gives all the practical tips about how to successfully manage your compost and get good outcomes. Um, and she's also the chair of the Biological Treatment Working Group of ISWA and works in the UK as a consultant advising organisations on sustainable organics waste management. So a very warm welcome to you, Jane. Thanks, Kat, and good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Um, so just to kick things off, uh, composting is a very niche field to end up in, um, Jane. So keen to, for you just to share, like, how did you even end up in this field? I think my luck more than anything else, but um, as, as you mentioned, uh, my background is in microbiology and I've always sort of had an interest in what goes on in the soil and what, what happens at the micro level. I guess it's um, the, the absolute opposite of astronomers that see the, the massive big picture out of, outside of our our world and our solar system, whereas actually I've sort of taken the opposite view and been fascinated by the, the, the minutiae and what it is that sort of underpins everything else that goes around on top of the world. So um, I think that's where my interest lay. And I was just lucky enough to be able to to get a job doing doing something like this that that brought together a lot of my background in microbiology, biochemistry um, and, and to put that into practice. And as with most things waste-wise, um, once you're hooked into it, you can't really escape because it's just <laughs> infinitely fascinating. I agree with you there, Jane. I did not plan a career in this field, oh. but I <laughs> find it fascinating. Um, the, more, the more I work in this field, the more I learn every, every year, every project, every day. So, no, it's fantastic. So one of the objectives of today's um, webinar is to help the audience understand the science behind compost. And so I thought, let's start at the beginning. Um, what exactly is compost? Well, compost, it, it doesn't take a genius to work out. It's the um, end result of a composting process. And that really is a natural process that involves natural microorganisms, bacteria and fungi that are around in, in our everyday environment. And what it does is it converts 
substances, things that we no longer need, putrescible materials, for example, food waste or garden and plant waste, and converts them into more stable forms of carbon to go into the soil, but also provides food and nourishment for the microbes that are, that are using it. That it's, it's a food source for us, but it's also a food source for them. So it's harnessing it and by doing it on a larger scale, we can increase the rate at which the process would normally occur. So there's nothing that goes on that wouldn't happen in the natural environment anyway, but we just by processing it, we get the temperatures higher and we can condense the time frame over which um, nat natural things would degrade anyhow in the environment. So it's all really part of a carbon cycle that would be happening anyhow. So um, the, the key aim is to produce a compost, to produce something that is high in stable carbon, humic substances that can then go back onto the soil to help improve that soil. Okay. And there's obviously a wide range of materials that can be converted into compost, organic materials. Can you give a sense of that range? Like what types of materials are we, we talking here? Uh, yeah, I mean, the two main feedstocks that we tend to think about, because we tend to really think about composting from a municipal point of view, um, it's about managing municipal waste. So waste that will arise in households, parks and gardens, municipal works, etc. Um, so the, the two main sources are firstly food waste, which I know cats doing an awful lot of work to minimise, but where it can't be minimised, the, the um, unavoidable food waste, then looking at composting that, but you can't compost food waste on its own. You need some bulking structural material that's higher in carbon. So you need to have, um, it, it's important to have garden waste there with woody waste to help balance it, balance what we call the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the, the, the two main feedstocks are those, but traditionally composting was carried out by farmers. That, that was the way that farmers dealt with any of their animal manures by composting it, by dealing with any of the, um, the, the remnants um, and the byproducts from growing food. So there's a long, long history of a many millennia of farmers reusing and composting their own materials in a variety of different ways to put back onto their soils when the farmers were much more in control of the soils and they owned the land on which they grew their, their food. So mm -hmm. we can look at animal, um, animal manures, we can look at um, crop residues and a wide range of other products that are perhaps falling out of, say, food processing processing industries and things like that. So a wide range, if it will biodegrade and if it will biodegrade without containing too many nasty contaminants, then it can be pretty much be composted. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying in that we use here in South Australia to help educate the residents. We say, if it grows, it goes, as in it goes in the um, compost bin. So yeah, um, yeah as, a, as a rule of thumb. Um, so it's interesting to hear you talk about um, how composting practices have been around for a very long time. And, you know, people, even farmers many, many centuries ago were, were practicing this. Now, obviously today, you know, the, the picture looks a little bit different. We've got these big commercial facilities in, in some cities around the world. So can you take us through, you know, when it comes to running one of these composting facilities, what type of um, infrastructure and equipment is there? What What's the typical setup look like? Well, it, it, it very much depends, first of all, on what the feedstocks are going to be. So if it's green garden waste only, it potentially can be composted in a simpler manner than taking in food waste or any other material that might be a bit more challenging to handle. But generally, the, the, the flow of the materials is by and large the same. It's just the infrastructure that surrounds it and the equipment that, that varies. Um, when it's received at a site, the first thing that any operator needs to do is to check the load for contamination. And any good composting facility will have rejection criteria set in any of their contracts so that if the material is too contaminated with things like, for example, plastic bags or uh, plant pots, plastic plant pots from garden waste, they cause horrendous problems because they just shatter. Plastic bags are the scourge of composters. 
Um, so it will arrive, they will need to um, check it for um, the amount of impurities that it contains or you know, check it for quality and to check that there's nothing in there that might affect the process. Then if it's very branchy and woody material, it would need to be chopped down a bit, put through some sort of shredding process to break it down to allow the microbes access to, to the woods on the inside. Um, and then it goes into the active composting phase. Now, this can be from a very simple means by just piling it high into what we call windrows and then mixing it every every few days or every week or so to redistribute all the material to let a bit more air in to release any stale gases or it could be in what we call an in-vessel system and there are a range of different in-vessel systems um, depending upon the size and the complexity of the site so it could just be a simple tunnel where air is pumped in but the material is wholly contained so any odorous materials can then be filtered out before they're vented to the atmosphere. Or we could have sort of smaller electromechanical systems, for example, cafes might use or larger restaurants in tourist areas and things like that. Um, after the active composting phase, <coughs> excuse me, um, it will, um, the material then be taken out and allowed to mature. And this is where a different type of process takes over um, the, the material goes from being fresh compost to being more mature and more stable, so it's less likely to harm plants, it's less likely to smell, and that maturation process can take anything up to, you know, eight to ten weeks as well. So, all in all, the, the process from, from input to output to produce a good, stable, mature compost, we're probably talking about eight to twelve weeks, although there are places in the world that will process it a lot quicker than that. Yeah, and so... You know, you've talked about the, the range of facilities and how they can, you know, be quite basic from open windrow through to, to more capital intensive, like the closed tunnel or in-vessel composting. Um, so we've got a question here from the audience that, I, um, that, was, that was posted uh, before the webinar, which I think links in quite well to this. It was, it was from someone um, who said, what is your recommendation for the size of a composting facility in a mega city like Istanbul with a population of over 16 million people? Um, and in particular, you know, is it a, would you recommend a centralised composting facility or one in each district or um, one in each community? I mean, this, it, you know, it's a great question and it raises a whole lot of other questions. And, you know, I'm not going to come up and, and just give you one size and say, this is what you need to do, because it, it's never that simple. I think the first thing, if you are looking at a citywide solution to managing organic waste is first to understand the type of organic waste that's going to be produced and in mega cities most of that will be food waste so less so potentially for parks and gardens and domestic gardens because people are living in apartments so we don't really you know they don't have access to to large gardens so i think the first thing to do is understand the types of organic waste that are being produced, when they're being produced, because parts of the world have very seasonal effects, certainly for green waste, less so for the food waste, but um, understanding where it's being produced and at, at what times of the year. And then a lot will often depend upon available land area. If you have, um, for example, a part of a closed landfill site, or you have areas uh, around the, the city that could be used cent for a centralised facility, then, then look into that. But being able to use those types of facilities um, depends upon good transport links. So is it possible to transfer that waste every day to that facility, given the road network or a rail network even? potentially. So looking at how you would transport that, collect and transport the waste. Or for example, if you have a lot of peri-urban agriculture, so agriculture right on the, you know, small farmers or small organic farmers, you know, a network of those might well work best. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. Um, you know, th th there's, there's some good examples of um, community composting systems um, where you know, we've got grassroots, um, you know, or clubs, organizations, groups of master composters that might well 
um, compost some of their green waste in communal parks and, and, and gardens and things like that that could be set up with the municipality. So rather than saying, I can't tell you what size, but what I can tell you is some of the um, some of the parameters that you will need to think about very carefully. So un understanding your waste, understanding transport networks and thinking right at the outset before you even start doing anything, looking to say, where can that compost go? We're not just treating waste here, we are producing a product. So making sure that you have that network, that you're engaging with local farmers, perhaps with the municipality for parks and gardens, for them to reuse that compost back in, in uh, public amenity areas. So a whole range of questions like that need to be answered before you can even start to look at sizing um, any sort of facility. Is there any guidance that has been developed by ISWA or through your other work that might provide a little bit like a document that kind of helps guide people through that decision making process? Um, there's some guides for smaller community systems, but not directly for larger scale systems in terms of decision making, because the criteria are always so um, site specific and context specific. What I can say, though, is um, that my colleague Bob Rink in the United States has been working for many years to produce a composting handbook, which we go through the final, I've, I've been a co-editor on it, I and mean, it's going through the final stages of proofing with the aim of being published by Elsevier next month. So keep an eye out for that. I'll certainly be tweeting about it. Um, and in terms of any sort of manual, that that would be the, that would be the, the, the composting Bible to, you know, uh, although it's very US based, very US centric, there will be a lot of, in, you know, important um, information in that will you know if you're thinking about um going down the route of um you know installing or um commissioning a composting facility brilliant um so now i'd like to hear from the audience i um Suisa, um has prepared a poll so i just wanted to get a sense of for the people listening in today what kind of systems you have at home so uh, this first question is what kind of organic waste collection do you have in your city is it one that collects food waste only? Does it collect green waste only? Or does it combine those two streams? Or do you have um, no, no collection at all, um, separate collection at all for those materials? give people a little bit of time to fill that out. There we go. And I can see here, so um, out of the, the people we have here today, it's interesting, majority of the participants have a food and green waste joint collection. Um, and I, I wonder if that might be because we, well, I don't have to check with Sweetha, but maybe we have quite a lot of uh, Australian participants <laughs> <laughs> We're given the time zone of today and, and we love Thank our... We love our FOGO, um, Food Organics, Garden Organics Combined Collection. So 41% of you um, have that in place. 25% are green waste only. And only 3% is, is food waste only. So Jane, where do you typically find those food waste only collections? I'm aware of them in places like Italy and, and some of Europe. Is that, does that sound about right? I th yes, I think so. I think, you know, there's, there's a few US cities as well that are starting to tackle the food waste um, element, but it's, yeah, I mean, the UK has has many hundreds now in the different districts, the different council areas. Um, and I think we're going to start to see a lot more in Europe because of the framework directive on waste, which specifies that um, the, the municipalities should be collecting um, or get well the bio waste they call it uh, separately and collecting food waste um, has advantages in many respects because um, as you work at it's a lot denser than normal waste so you can actually collect a lot more inside a inside a truck you don't actually need a compacting refuse vehicle to collect it and you can you can get through quite a lot of households quite quickly um, by, by, by doing that. Um, a lot of the food waste here in the UK is going to anaerobic digestion, which is 
um, in many respects great because it's producing a renewable biogas um, and in light of the COP um, meetings next week, you know, that, that's really important in terms of offsetting um, natural gas, but it creates some ongoing issues regarding, um, you know, regarding the use of the digest state. Um, garden waste, as probably aware, it, vast, vast majority of it is quite branchy. It has a much lower density, so collection can be more challenging. So mm. that is why the um, municipalities in the UK, mostly in Italy as well, and starting to in other parts of Europe as well, have been just looking at collecting food waste separately from, from garden waste. So we don't have your FOGO collections, Kat, that um, your Aussies are so um, <laughs> uh, keen on. Um, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, it, it very much depends upon the infrastructure that you have in place um, and, and the capacity to collect that and process that waste as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I should say as well, I'm noticing a, the audience in the comments section uh, in the chat box, sorry. Um, you know, I shouldn't say we only have Australians on the line. We've also got someone, a few people from the UK. We've got people from um, uh, Peru and Chile, uh, Brazil or Sao Paulo and, and others as well. So thank you. Thank you for joining the discussion today. So um, I might uh, just move on to um, talk about the topic of, of compost and soil health because that's something that we really wanted to touch on today. So it's a well-known fact that when you, you apply compost to soils, it, it improves the health of the soil. But can you explain the science in simple terms on, on how that compost can improve soil health? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the main advantage of putting compost onto soil is as a soil improver and it's through its organic matter and organic matter is really really important in in the vast majority of soils it, it's really important in the soils in which we grow our food so you know let, let, let's just focus focus on that um, by putting the organic matter on round about half of it will be what we call labile carbon. So it's carbon that will be there as food for the microbes and the, the creepy crawlies, the invertebrates in the soil, for them to use as food source. There's a certain percentage of the carbon though that will actually be transformed or, or is when it's put onto soil in more stable forms. And it is this that can then actually complex with um, things like clay particles, on and be taken down into the lower parts of the soil where it can stay there for many, many, many years. So we can sort of think of that as a sequestra sequestration effect. Um, but in itself, organic matter in soils, um, it, it's very much about helping improve the structure of the soil. So soils that have had lots and lots of harvests that have been used for intensive arable agriculture these soils tend to become quite compacted. There's a massive loss of um, carbon from the soils. And by putting this organic matter back, you're helping to create that structure. It helps to reform lots of the pore networks in the soil. It helps to retain moisture, which is becoming such an important issue. It's providing food. And it also creates a much more, an improved buffering effect by binding onto some of the positive ions in, um, in the soil, including things like fertilizers. So it helps as well with fertilizer um, application and use and, and uptake. So we lose less of it into, into water courses. Um, so a wide range of benefits um, linked to sort of biological activity, physical structure, and the way in which the chemicals um, you know, um, are bound and, and utilized within soil. So a wide range of um, benefits that really the vast vast majority of arable soils are in desperate need of yeah interesting and i know that you recently undertook some work with iswa um, looking at the state of soils around the world so can you share some of the things you found through that project yeah it was a, it was a two-year project um in conjunction with my who was then chair of our working group marco ritchie jurgensen in italy uh, he's now my vice chair and i'm the chair with sort of swap swap seat so to speak <laughs> and also with R aditi ramola and aditi is the technical director at iswa um what we it, 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 we realized and we've known this for a long long time that 
in many respects, the value of the organic matter and compost has never really been fully um, appreciated. It's been qualitative. Everyone said, of course, we need organic matter in our soils, but we've never really quantified that. So what we did was we had a look, um, first of all, tried to work out as best we could how much organic waste was actually produced every year. And we think from the municipal sources, so excluding things like agriculture, um, that we just have slightly under a billion tonnes of organic waste produced from municipal sources every year. That is one billion. And a lot of that has been concentrated in the big mega cities, for example, in China uh, and in the Far East specifically. Um, so big challenges there. The second part of the project we looked at was to try to say, well, what are actually the benefits of putting compost and anaerobic digestate onto soils? So we, we, we did a, a, a big literature review and pulled together the best available evidence that, that we have at the moment. And whilst there is an awful lot of benefits of compost going onto soils, the, the, the case was less marked for anaerobic digestate in so much as the, the, the material is different, it, it's, it's a different type of material from compost by nature of the fact that the feedstocks going into the digester are very different and the process is very different. So they, they do different things in different ways and digestate really because of the way in which the carbon um, um, is, is present, the, 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 the types of carbon and the nutrient content, they, it's very much seen as a biofertilizer. So replacing a lot of the fertilizers that farmers would be putting onto their soils anyhow. Whereas mm -hmm. with compost, it's the opposite way around. The nutrients aren't generally there in a, in a crop ready format. So farmers wouldn't necessarily use them directly for, um, for a, as a fertilizer replacement, but what they will do is use them as, um, as an organic matter source for just as a soil improver to improve that functionality and the productivity of the soils. Yes. So that was the second part of the project. The third part was we looked at different soils in a few different parts of the world. Um, Australia being one, thanks to you, Kat. Um, we also had the UK, Italy, um, Brazil and um, Chile as well. And all areas around the world with very different types of soils in the you know in, in in Australia you have very old old soils you know hundreds of thousands of years old whereas in Europe certainly in the UK our soils are much younger and only really stem from the last sort of 10 20,000 years since the receding of the ice age but all the soils we found were suffering from one main threat which was intensive agriculture and loss of organic matter and degradation of those soils and the Food and Agriculture Organization and the um, in Soils Partnership as well has done an awful lot of work publishing lots of the detail into that. So if you go onto the FAL website, you can find a massive, um, massive, massive amount of information there. Um, so that's what we looked at there in the in the third report. So it was very much spreading spreading the net. What are the issues? And the issues by and large are all the same. It's overuse, overintensification of agriculture, coupled with poor, um, coupled with poor regulation and effective policy instruments. The third report, we, we, we built on all of that work and actually tried to quantify the benefits of putting soil um, carbon onto soil in the form of compost. So we think it's the first study that, um, that we've carried out where we've actually quantified what those benefits are quantified them in carbon dioxide equivalence terms and also try to put a value on them um, in terms of US dollars or euros or um, Australian um, Australian dollars or Indian rupees you know it we, we, we try to sort of put that um, you know those benefits onto um, onto those soils so all of those um, reports are freely available to download from the ISWA website and um, you know, if, if you go to the iswa.org website and scroll through to our biological treatment working group, um, then they, they should be, they, they will be there for you to download and to have a look at. Yeah. So Jane, I think everyone's now wondering, um, since you mentioned you quantified it, what is the magic number of, 
of the potential benefit? There is, as you'd probably expect me to say, Kat, I need to caveat all of this. There are no magic numbers. Um, <laughs> but what we did was we took a rate, we, we assumed a range of different sequestration rates based upon what had been published in the scientific literature based on experimental data. And we, we, we took a range of different rates um looking at the soil organic carbon that would go onto soils and actually stay on soils for long term in the long term so not the short-term carbon that would be used up within a year or two um, feeding the microbes but the stuff that will stay in there for long periods of time and we did we used three different scenarios and i have to admit i was probably erring on the side of caution and use lower values than a lot of people have said we ought to have been using and, and that was for a reason uh, because i didn't want to overestimate the the, the, the potential but the, the calculations came out in the region of somewhere like um 60 to up to about 150 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per ton of fresh compost um when put onto soil so we can start to look and you know if, if a facility is, say, producing 20,000 tonnes of compost a year and assuming this is good, stable compost that has been gone through a, a, an adequate maturation phase, then you can start to put some figures on that and quantify these benefits. So 60 to 150 kilograms of per carbon dioxide, of carbon dioxide mm. per, per tonne of compost applied to soil. Yes, yes. Fr fresh, fresh, fresh matter. And of course, it depends upon the moisture content, um, you know, that, that's, that's in the compost. And it's, you know, it, it depends on a whole range of different scenarios. But, you know, that was the, the, the ballpark figure there that, that we came up with, which is in line with um, similar um, calculations that, you know, other people have done in terms of sequestration and based on experimental data. So Okay, so just so what I might do is I might come back to that point, but I'm going to take a, a step back for the audience because we've been talking about carbon sequestration a lot. Um, and I just thought it would, you know, explain. So you talked to, uh, before about um, compost and the soil health, but can you explain the link between um, how when you apply compost on soils, it, it actually leads to, to carbon sequestration? Yeah, well, if, if you've got a good, good quality compost that has been through a proper process, and certainly if you've got that green waste in there as well, you've got a lot of that woody material. So when you're producing compost, what you have is a process called humification. And some of that happens during the composting process. And some of that happens after the compost has been put onto the soil as well. And, and humus, the, you know, the, the stuff that you'd see if you went for a walk in the woods, um, you know, most certainly terrestrial woods, perhaps your um, your gum tree um, woods are slightly different, um, <laughs> your, your forest uh, um, you know, in parts of Australia, Cap. but, you know, even if you go to the Northern Territories, you will still see a lot of humic material there, and that is starting to become this really stable carbon, and there are a lot more, um, the, you know, the, there's, there's a lot more information uh, coming to light about how this is now being transformed how this is actually staying in the soil as these really long-term humic substances and some of them can stay you know estimates that they can actually stay in there for many many hundreds if not thousands of years so it's all part of a natural soil forming process um, which we're really just harboring and trying to offset the soil destroying processes that are happening because of intensive arable um, agricultural practices in most parts of the world. So unless you're an organic farmer, um, where soil is, you know, that, that you know, it, it, it's your baby, you know, if you don't don't nurture your soils in an organic system, you, 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 you can't produce the, your produce. Um, so, um, it, it, yes, it, it's all about the complexity and very complex biochemistry that I have to admit I don't fully understand and why it's produced, not entirely sure, but it, it's all part of natural soil forming process and it's part of that carbon, natural carbon cycle as well. 
Oh, it's good. Thank you, Jane, for explaining that that connection. So bringing you back to your earlier point about um, how much carbon um, dioxide equivalent is, is sequestered through the soil per tonne of, of fresh um, compost. So you said 60 to 150 kilograms of CO2 per, per a tonne of fresh compost. What If, if we were to um, create a lot more compost in the world, how, how much, how much um, impact, climate impact are we potentially talking? Well, if I could share my screen briefly with you. Um, Please, go for it. If I do that one. So please tell me when that's come through, Kat. Yep. Okay. So here are some calculations that um, I did recently they're slightly different to the ISWA ones just because I use some slightly different assumptions and, and with all of these you know any estimations of these sources it always based you know very much bases uh, you know upon the assumptions that you make um, but we know that roundabout from our ISWA um, from from our ISWA work that in the region of about 83 million tons of bio waste every year so that's food and garden waste principally are either composted or um, you know, man managed um, in, a, in, a, in a treatment process. But we know that potential is slightly under 1 million, slightly under 1,000 million or 1 billion tonnes produced every year. And we know that in many, many parts of the world, this is managed inappropriately. So we're having a lot of methane being produced. If it's going to informal dump sites, um, burning of it can release black carbon. So in terms of the COP, process next week, reducing fugitive methane emissions and reducing black carbon through burning of wastes is, you know, two of the main ways in which organic matter can be transformed from being a significant climate change problem to being potentially a solution as well. So if we if we take that billion tons and we compost it all, and I have to say and, and just stress that this is would need to be separately collected. So I'm not talking about mixed municipal waste. Um, I'm not talking about poorly, you know, highly contaminated material. It would need to be quality assured um, and have very low, um, you know, levels of inorganic and um, and chemical impurities in it. But if we compost all of that, based upon the carbon that would be stored through the actual organic matter and the avoided emissions that would be um, the emissions in carbon dioxide that would be avoided from fertilizer production and we know that nitrogen based fertilizers in particular uh, are massive massive emissions of um, greenhouse gases both during their production and their end use um, the harbour bosch process is very energy intensive and um, if they're put onto soils in too high rates, then nitrous oxide emissions are a very, very potent greenhouse gas as well. And collectively, agriculture just through fertilizer manufacture and use uh, can be anywhere up to about 2.2, 2.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So we have the massive um, potential there to to help reduce that just on a fertilizer point of view, let alone the the, the structure of the um, of, of the um, soils. So if we do those calculations, we could potentially be we're currently sequestering in the region of about nine million tons mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide equivalents every year, but that could almost be tenfold higher, slightly over tenfold higher. Um, if we were to collect all of this other waste, and that's just in the value of the compost alone, that's not about the avoided emissions. These are just the emissions by um, avoiding the fertilizer element and also the carbon element um, that would go into the soil. Um, we need to be careful because I'm not necessarily comparing like with like here in terms of the fertilizers, because I'm not taking into account any production um, emissions. Uh, of, of um, the climate you know, in terms of producing compost but that's um, you know that, that they're the they're the top level the big macro um, estimates so um, that's 90 potentially we could go sorry one slide back sorry so the, the headline number there was 98 million 
that tons of CO2 equivalent? Yes, so tons of CO2 the- equivalent every year by putting that compost onto soil. That's um, not a know. small amount. That's quite. That's a very big amount. So yeah, it, it certainly is a is a yeah key part to um, yeah. potentially reaching net zero is, is is the way we manage our organics and and composting the material. So yeah, fascinating right. findings, Jane. And I appreciate um, you know the number of assumptions, etc., and your caveats associated with this slide. But still, it's good to get a ballpark figure and understand mm-hmm. the potential magnitude of impact that this can have. So it, it's a I really hope this is being talked about at COP26 as one of the potential solutions. So. Yeah, actually, I apologise. I should have put that onto, um, onto that. I mean, if we just go on to the next slide, just very briefly, just in terms of the carbon that's stored in soil, at the moment it's about 5 million, and then the avoided emissions as the fertiliser, 4 million. So that's where that nine comes from. Okay. But, mm-hmm. so, but collectively, if we go to have that sort of 98 million, um, you know, from the carbon in the soil and the emissions as fertilizers, you know, that's, that's equivalent at the moment to over 600 billion smartphone charges. And the potential is around about 12 trillion, you know, that was just putting these factors in these numbers into the um, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, um, greenhouse gas equivalent um, calculator in, in, the, in the US. Um, or it's, you know, equivalent to assuming US gas guzzling cars of, you know, 36 billion kilometres driven in a car a year, or potentially up to um, just under 400 billion. So massive, massive um, figures there. Um, and I, I did a quick back of an envelope calculation at one point to see how many um, kilometres it would be from the Earth to the, to the, to the moon and back. And it was a lot more than the Apollo missions, put it like that, by a good few orders of magnitude. So, um, wow. yeah, so, <laughs> you know, but there's there's real potential. But, you know, I have to say that composting is not a holy grail. The way I think of it is that it is one piece and a very important piece of a big jigsaw puzzle. Without that one piece, we don't have a whole picture and the, and the jigsaw is incomplete, but it does need to go hand in hand with other aspects, for example, improved agricultural practices, improved land use practices, um, where soils aren't left um, bare, for example, like so many of them are in the UK. Um, So a range of different other actions that are also needed in conjunction with this. So we want, you know, that there is a potential synergy there to to even increase this further um, by, Mm. by completing that jigsaw puzzle and completing that picture in the jigsaw puzzle. Excellent. Thank you, Jane. Um, I have another question here which relates to this um, from uh, someone posted, I am leading a national project involving communities throughout China, trying to compost food and garden waste in cities. People are keen to learn how to manage their compost in a climate and environmentally friendly way and to assess their impacts. So how so the, the the information you provided here is very much that macro level picture, um, but the question is looking at the micro level. So how do you estimate the greenhouse gas emissions from the community composting of bio waste in urban areas, and assess the soil, food, and climate impacts of community composting? So that's small scale. Yeah, and you know that was a very good question. When I saw it, I thought, yes, this is sort of hitting lots of different buttons and lots of different um, aspects. I think the first thing, like I said earlier on, is, is is really understanding the types of food waste, because my experience of China is that the food waste is very different from the um, food waste that we would normally have in Western Europe. It tends to be certainly in the West of China, where they have a lot of hot pots. It's very wet. So there's an awful lot of liquid in there. There's also quite a lot of salt in there as well. It's very salty as well. So. Um, it's, it's understanding that, um, understand those food waste um, applications and how composting is actually going to be carried out. I'm currently involved in a big project, leading a big project in Mongolia, which isn't um, a million miles away from, um, um, you know, isn't a million miles away from, 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 from China. And we're doing exactly the same thing. So what we're having to consider is a lack of green waste because most people in the, in the city, in the city centers, in, um, in the capital, in Ulaanbaatar, live in big apartment blocks. There are green spaces around, but most people don't have gardens. So very similar to China. 
So we've been trying to work out how can we um, approach, excuse me, um, how can we approach um, that in a, in a way that would allow for nice warm summers, but very extremely cold winters. So we're looking at um, an innovative box composting method that was that's been championed over in Costa Rica. We're also looking at engaging with schools to do some community composting in schools and kindergartens, so that that community group, and once again, getting a network of people from the ground up through master composter schemes can really help to um, help to inspire people and instilling them with local knowledge, local know how people being able to trust their their um, their trained master composters. So that is one of the aspects that we're looking at for the schools and kindergartens and that could potentially be extended as well to uh, green areas around apartment blocks um of you know in mega cities of which you know that the, the, there are many now in china um and then you know having some sort of centralized approach because centralized composting is only ever really going to address the um, soil needs of farmers if it is done on a reasonable scale home composting is never going to do that community composting is never going to do that it needs to be um you know on a larger scale so it's looking at the demographics where can those systems go what type of waste is going to go into it so for farmers potentially to actually use that compost themselves that they're manufacturing so um you know, it was, it's interesting. I wouldn't mind touching base with the person who is doing that just to <laughs> compare notes with what we're trying to do in, um, in, in, in Mongolia at the moment. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. And so you touched on, Jane, a lot of the different projects you're doing and you talked about educating people around the impacts and how to compost, etc. Apart from that education piece and, and being able to measure the impacts, what, you know, what is, what are the, biggest barriers that you're seeing um, that's preventing cities from actually introducing um, these these systems to separately collect organics and then compost or process it into an end product and, and send it to an, a market for, for use? Yeah, but it, it, it comes down to, is there um, suitable regulation or policy um, framework in place? Um, and I think the um, um, going back to Australia here, Kat, but the um, Australian Organics Recycling Association, AURA, did some work recently. And one of the biggest impediments was a lack of decent policy um, framework or legislative framework being able to drive that um, in different parts of the world. The, you know, the, there's issues about collection that would need to be pump primed in some way. Um, but having that driver that will force municipalities, force councils to consider the way in which they're managing waste and to look towards diverting it either from sanitized land, you know, sanitary landfills or dump sites, which are the predominant disposal um, method in so many parts of the world. Without that, nothing is really going to happen. But I always say it needs to be a top down and a bottom up approach with the two meeting in the middle. So unless you have local mayors, local civic leaders, local councils that where you have people champion and wanting to improve the environment and the health of their residents, unless you have that as well, nothing's going to happen. So it's it's a multifaceted approach, but really where Europe, I think, has been so innovative over the last 20, 30 years has been through European legislation within the European Union, um, which sadly the UK is not part of it anymore. Um, but having those macro level drivers to encourage and force member states to manage ways in more sustainable manner has given investors um, that, that um, confidence that the policy is not going to be changed overnight come the next government come the next fad going you know coming in or whatever and the, the, there is a framework for investment by private and public sectors mm -hmm. and that, certainly that's something i've observed through my food waste research is you know that the cities even legislation is also sometimes at a city level like san francisco for example um so you know those jurisdictions that do have legislation that either you know mandates or separation of, of organics or banned 
organics from landfill, these types of things tend to be performing a lot higher. So it, it's really interesting to, to see that seems to be the case. It's backed up by, by data and uh, I would love to see something like that in Australia, <laughs> well, um, across across Australia. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, we're, we're moving we're moving more to that area. Um, I think in New South Wales, they're looking at introducing um, some stuff around the source separation requirements. So yeah, yes, it's, well, it's, well, I see um, Amanda from New South Wales is sitting in on this. So hi, Amanda, and uh, yes, I think she's doing a a good job there, trying to promote it in New South Wales. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. Um, all right. Well, uh, so there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of as you said a lot of players involved, and we need both the, the top down and the, the bottom up, and they're meeting in the middle, which can sound intimidating in terms of how how much needs to happen. But on the other hand, it's quite empowering to think about that we can all play a role, um, whether or not that's from a, a community individual level, or whether you're a policy or reg, you know policy maker or regulator or your your business um in you know or you know anybody and everybody we all we all have a, a role to play in in transitioning um to more sustainable um organic waste management practices so um on that note i um want to um wrap it up all in a, a nice uh bow uh jane in terms of you know some takeaways for today for the audience if you could leave them with a few messages um, what would you like to say i think when you're thinking about organics recycling don't just think of it from a waste management perspective you need to think of it it's part of a carbon cycle it's part of a nutrient cycle so right from the outset don't just think about it in terms of we have this waste we need to manage it um, oh, we'll, we'll think about the product at the end of the day. Really get the buy-in from farmers because that's where the real benefits are going to be um, felt in terms of farmers putting it back onto their arable soils that are so low in organic matter. That's really where the, the main soil benefits are going to come from. So think about this holistically in terms of all the different actors that are going to need to be um, brought in and also think about it very much in terms of getting some grassroots support as well grassroots support from within farming communities within within um cities you know citizens living in um in towns in cities in in villages as well um and thinking you know it's part of a holistic um carbon cycle so we need to start thinking in those terms as well and that's where the the, the main um benefits are going to come from fantastic thank you jane and i think that's uh systems thinking is is really important that's certainly been a theme um from our discussions today and i really like some of the you know for me i was thinking about some of the the, the language that you used earlier moving from soil destroying to soil saving and that climate problem to a climate solution so uh, just one last question I'm going to ask you. Um, so if you could deliver a personal message to the world leaders at COP26 in relation to this issue, what would it be? It would really be to, to like you've just said, Kat, systems thinking and not by partitioning problems up into either waste management or agriculture or food production, they're all linked. So start to create those linkages between these different sectors, because that's really going to be the only way that we can effectively achieve a synergy rather, you know, the, the sum of the parts is, is greater than the, than the individual parts on their, on their own. So really thinking about this in a, in a systems way, um, thinking about this holistically, and how can we work in different ways to what we have worked in in the past. And I think underpinning all of that as well, um, which you're probably going to be inter more interested in, Kat, as an economist, is a different way of accounting that takes a triple bottom line approach and embedding that within our societies, within our economic structures and financial structures. Um, so that you know they would be the two things that i would say hand in hand need to go together well thank you jane you've been fantastic and um, i'm sure all the audience have appreciated your insights today and being able to explain some otherwise pretty complex science
concepts and 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 um, explaining the the science behind soil health and and carbon sequestration and all the rest of it, and indeed sharing the exciting research that you've been doing about the impacts um, of of uh, applying compost to soil and on uh, co the climate and and food security and everything like that. So no, thank you. I've really enjoyed our discussion, and thanks to all our audience. Um, thank you for. Your, the questions that you posted. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to move through all of them, um, but it's been a, a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, over thanks, Kat. And it, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, um, you know, contributing to it. I'm looking forward to actually reading the questions now because I couldn't quite see them as I was talking. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's it's been great. So happy to uh, come back at some point, hopefully after the COP, and we can see you know where, how things are moving on potentially. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. Okay, Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kat. Thanks a lot for your time. It was a very interesting discussion, and you and like Kat mentioned, you broke very complex like science and into very simple terms that everyone could understand. And I'm pretty sure the audience response speaks for itself. So, uh, it, to the audience, this webinar is recorded. You will have access to it, and it will go up on our website in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please go to our website and sign up for it. You will get alerts about the next webinars about the upcoming webinars so thanks a lot have a good day and bye-bye thanks bye